get started. So um, our first speaker in the afternoon is Marty Uzri. All right. So it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm excited to take part in one of these workshops. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's, it's really wonderful. Uh, I am the second speaker in basically a, a, a session that we have on thinking about the visual system and the role that the thalamus serves along with the cortex and how those two structures work <laughs> intimately together to uh, guide uh, cortical function and, and the processing of visual information. So uh, in my talk, I, went, I took a few slides out, actually, so that we could get uh, in, more interactive if, if we go down that path. So hopefully we can. Uh, I work in the early visual system, uh, namely the retina that lines the back of the eye, the lateral geniculate nucleus, and the primary visual <coughs> cortex. And as I'm sure everybody in the room knows, retinal ganglion cells send their axons to target cells in the geniculate. These are the relay cells that then send their axons to primary visual cortex. And this pathway, as I've described it, is the feed-forward pathway. It's, the convey, it's conveying signals from the eye up to the cortex in this feed-forward direction. Now, in the visual system, uh, there is also a very dense feedback pathway where neurons in primary visual cortex send axons back to the geniculate. And it's this interaction of feed-forward and feedback pathways that govern, largely govern the response properties of neurons in the LGN and how they influence the, the activity of these cells will ultimately determine the signals that will make their way to cortex. So if we can get a sense for how these feed forward and feedback pathways interact, we can have a much better understanding of the nature of the signals and how they can be uh, dynamically influenced as those signals propagate from retina to cortex. Okay, so the question that I wanna to address today is namely how do these feed forward and feedback pathways interact during visual processing? And this slide is a little bit more detail of the circuit diagram. It's still a bit of an oversimplification, but we have the retina with the axons projecting to the lateral geniculate nucleus, those axons going up the cortex. There's some intrinsic uh, circuitry in the cortex that's gonna further process those signals. But importantly, we have that feedback pathway, okay? So we have the feed forward input to the geniculate, that feedback pathway to the geniculate. And there's a few, um, facts that we have to uh, all, you know, all understand to, to be able to uh, move forward with thinking about how these pathways interact. So one really striking finding is that retinal ganglion cells, their synapses constitute only five to 10% of the total number of synapses onto geniculate cells. So it's the minority of inputs that are, uh, that are coming from the retina to, to drive responses into the geniculate. If you look at this feedback pathway, more than 50% of the synapses onto those same cells come from the feedback projections. So just based from an anatomical perspective or, or thinking about it uh, in terms of the numbers, you would think this feedback pathway is doing all of the work. But there's some things that we need to understand about these, these synapses to understand that one is a driving source of input and the other is what we believe to be a modulatory source of input. So these inputs coming from the retina, these are very large synapses compared to the feedback synapses, which are much smaller. These are located more proximally on the dendritic arbors of geniculate cells where the feedback synapses are more peripherally. And also uh, the feed forward, uh, under those synapses we have exclusively ionotropic receptors where in the feedback pathway it's a combination of ionotropic and metabotropic. So there's some definite differences between the synapses provided from the feed forward and feedback pathways that we need to think about when we're thinking about what roles these pathways serve. Now another important point to make is that this feedback projection has the opportunity to have both a monosynaptic excitatory influence as well as a disynaptic uh, inhibitory influence. All of the uh, neurons in the thalamic reticular nucleus are GABAergic. So this collateral that comes off of these feedback in axons that goes into the thalamic nucleus has the opportunity then to provide a polysynaptic or disynaptic inhibition. Okay, now these, this feedback pathway originates from neurons in layer six of visual cortex. And at the end of the talk, I'll talk briefly about a pathway that Murray brought up, that cortical pulvinar pathway, just to compare and contrast the influence of layer six feedback versus layer five projections and the influence that they have. Okay, all right, so uh, how can we study this feed forward projection? So the first part of the talk, what I'd like to do is focus on the feed forward projections from retina to LGN. And then I'll turn and talk about the feedback projections. So when we look at the feed forward projections, there's a wonderful preparation that one can do in the anesthetized animal 
whereby you can record from synaptically connected pairs of cells. And this isn't easy, but it's certainly doable. And what makes it doable is the fact that both structures have a retinotopic map to them. So what's illustrated here is how one goes about identifying pairs of cells that are synaptically connected. Simply put a, an electrode array into the geniculate, and then one can look at the surface of the retina. And when you look at the surface of the retina, this is the vasculature, here's an electrode, this is a little laser, this is an experiment in, in going on. You can direct that laser to find the region of the retina that excites the cells that you're recording from, and then just manipulate your electrode to touch down on that site. Okay? Now, that'll put you in close proximity, so you can start asking questions about are they connected or not connected, and I'll talk about how we do that in just a moment. Uh, to map the cell's receptive fields, we use a variety of stimuli. One stimulus that we use quite often is a white noise stimulus. Many of you in this room know the stimulus very, very well, but some of you may not. It looks like a checkerboard, basically, of black and white pixels, rapidly, rapidly changing between what's white and what's black. It's governed by an M sequence. And, when you, and this is a really nice stimulus to use when you're mapping many cells' receptive fields simultaneously. Because as long as they're somewhere on that screen, you can get a nice receptive field map of their spatial structure and also with the influence that time has on that as well. Okay, and that, that analysis that we do, I should just mention, is a reverse correlation analysis, where for every spike that occurs from the cells that you're recording from, you just look back in time and ask what was the stimulus that preceded those spikes. Okay, so this is that preparation I mentioned just a moment ago. Here are two receptive field maps from two cells recorded from simultaneously. Uh, one in the retina, one in the lateral geniculate nucleus. Our convention is for regions of the, of the stimulus that would excite the cell when the pixels were white are indicated in red. So these would be on subregions. Regions of the stimulus that would excite the cells when they were black, they're indicated in blue. So those would be off subregions. So these are very stereotypical on center, off surround receptive fields. And even though they're shown side by side here, again, they correspond to the same area of visual space. This uh, uh, circle drawn over the retinal ganglion cell, that same exact circle is shown superimposed over the geniculate receptive field. Okay, so receptive, fim some receptive field similarity doesn't necessarily mean the cells are connected. So to assess connectivity, we can do a cross-correlation analysis where we're basically just looking at the spike trains of the two cells and asking what's the relationship between them. So in this case, you take the retinal ganglion cell spike train, set them to time zero, look before and after each retinal spike, and ask what did the geniculate cell do. And for cells that are monosynaptically connected, you see this very abrupt peak in their cross correlogram. It's shifted to the right of zero by about three and a half to four milliseconds, a very steep rise to it. And you have that when you're using, say, a drifting grating stimulus, a white noise stimulus like we see up above, or even if you just have the animal sitting in the dark and you're measuring spontaneous activity. Okay. So, what do we find? Well, here are just as many receptive fields I could fit on one uh, screen, where we have the retinal ganglion cell receptive field to the left of the LGN neurons receptive field. All of these were cell pairs that were monosynaptically connected. And you can see that they look remarkably similar to each other. So there's, and this is already pretty well known. The receptive fields of geniculate neurons in the cat are very similar to those of their retinal inputs. Nevertheless, we can quantify the extent of their similarity and also the strength of the connection with a few values. Uh, so to compare their similarity, we can do a normalized dot product where we just look at the two cells receptive field maps. If they're perfectly overlapped, same sign, they'd get a value of one, perfectly overlapped but opposite in sign, say an on center over an off center cell, that would be minus one and as they start to pull apart, you approach zero. Contribution here is the measure of strength of connection. So this is the percentage of the geniculate cell spikes that were driven or evoked from that simultaneously recorded <laughs> retinal ganglion cell. Okay, And to make it really easy, all it literally is is the number of spikes in the peak of the cross correlogram divided by the total number of geniculate spikes. That's your contribution value. Okay, so when you do that, what you find is that uh, and, and I should mention that the green asterisks correspond to cell pairs that were deemed to be connected. And the pink circles here were cell pairs that were not connected, okay? And there's two take home messages from this. One, as the receptive fields become more and more similar, there's an increase in the probability of connectivity. And as they become more and more similar, there's an increase in that strength of connection. And you know, you can go back and forth in terms of what's determining the other. More likely it's the strength of connections that's determining the degree of similarity between the receptive fields.
Okay, so this is basically a background to, to illustrate that the retina is, is, is the driving force to the geniculate cells, that the receptive fields of those geniculate cells are very, very similar to the retinal inputs. All right, so why have a lateral geniculate nucleus? Uh, why is it there? If you're not going to do anything in terms of transforming the spatial structure of receptive fields, what is it doing? And we were interested in what it might be doing in the temporal domain. What might it be doing in terms of filtering those incoming retinal spike trains to selectively pass some spikes to cortex but not others? And that's where I want to go next. So if you look at any given pair of cells, one thing that always stands out is that the retina fires at a much higher rate than does the lateral geniculate nucleus cells, okay, their target cells. So some spikes will get through, others don't. And that raises the question of, is there a difference between those that will evoke a response and those that won't? So to tackle this question, what we did was to take all of the spikes from a given retinal ganglion cell and just sort them into two categories, those that would evoke a response and those that did not. If you evoked a response, that signal gets relayed up to cortex. If you don't re evoke a response, that signal was lost. Okay. Now, these are two pools of spikes. So we would, and they're not going to be exactly matched in numbers, so whichever group had the more spikes, we would just subsample that so that we would have spike count match data sets. And we did that because then we could run these spikes through the reverse correlation analysis and look at the optimal stimulus for them. And that's what we see below here. So what we can do now is directly compare the brightness of these pixels, and that gives you an indication of the correlation between the stimulus and, and the spiking behavior of the cell. So the spikes that are relayed to cortex have stronger receptive field maps than the spikes that aren't relayed. Another way to view it is that there's, we're getting rid of more of the noise spikes uh, at the synapse and, and retaining those spikes that are, that are telling us something about the stimulus. Yeah, Massimo. Um, do those uh, retinal axon diverge on multiple DLGN neurons? It does. It and, um, uh, have you ever recorded from two the DLGN neurons that receive input from the same... Uh, we have. Uh, Retinal ganglia. So right. Do they select the same spike, the one that are lost for one cell are lost? So the non-relayed are non-relayed in both. Right. So what you find is that the same retinal spike can often drive synchronous spikes in the pair. And I don't have time to go into it now, but what's special about those synchronous spikes is they're really they're synergistically interacting with each other to drive the cortical target cells because they arrive simultaneously in time to their target cells in the cortex. Yeah, great question. Oh, yeah. So when you do have a strongly connected retina LGM pair, I mean, how often do you see an LGN spike that doesn't have a mm -hmm. oh. spike? Great question. It depends on the species that you're looking at. So if you're looking at cat, that number is uh, um, not 100%. If you're looking at monkey, it is. Okay, and that's just because in cat there's convergence of somewhere between, sometimes there's single cell inputs, but typically it's two to five, or in the monkey it's one to one. And in that monkey then, every single LGN cell spike is believed to be evoked by a retinal spike. Which means none of the other inputs cause a spike. Which right there would tell you that the other inputs aren't. That's not quite exactly true when, when you look at bursts in the LGN, but that's a whole other topic that we can touch upon maybe in discussion. Yeah. I'm, I'm confused about you know, the conclusion you drew. You said because they look similar, the receptive field, you know, with that are and are not related. You said somehow that meant it was excluding noise spike. I don't. Know, it looks almost like that's what you get if it just simply threw away a random percentage of a random fraction. Well, remember, of there's the exact same number of spikes that went into these maps. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the case on the left, more of those spikes were consistently associated in this case with a white pixel in the center, where over here it was a smaller fraction of those total spikes was associated with a white pixel in the center. They could have been associated with a black pixel in the center. Okay, all right. So if you just want to use, there's many ways you can quantify this. One way would just be to look at the center amplitude between the relayed and non-relayed spikes. So the relayed and non-relayed, and you see across cell pairs that the amplitude is greater for the relayed cell spikes. You can also do an information theoretic analysis and look to look, calculate the bits per spike and see that they're carrying uh, more bits to the cortex as well on average. So the LGN, some people call it a dumb relay. I'd say it's a very smart relay. It's picking off these more informative spikes to, to relay to cortex. Now, let's see here. Uh, let's see, I'm running 
geez, I'm running fast, short on time fast. So I am going to skip these things here and just basically bring up how would the geniculate know which spikes are more informative. They, you know, a spike is a spike. They have an all or nothing, all or nothing event. They should look the same in their spatial structure, according to them. They don't quite exactly, but nevertheless, what mechanism might underlie this? And what we decided to look at was the temporal structure of the spike train, in particular, what role the inner spike interval between spikes might play. Okay, is there an interaction that you would see between spikes based on how far apart they are when they would arrive to the geniculate cell? And what you find is that's indeed the case. Here we're just looking at two different stimulus conditions, a drifting grating or white noise. And if you look at a pair of spikes, okay, the first spike and the second spike of a pair, as they vary in inner spike interval, so you pull them further and further apart in time, you see that those second spikes are more effective than this first spikes out to about 30 milliseconds. So very consistent with the notion of temporal summation, okay? That when these spikes arrive close in time, they can summate with each other and drive that postsynaptic cell. What's interesting about that is that the time course of this nicely fits the time course for the more informative spikes. So here we just look at the distribution of inner spike intervals for 20 different retinal ganglion cells. And again, if you do that analysis I described where you subsample so that you're using the exact same number of spikes across all of these different ISIs, you find that it's the shortest ISI spike bin that has the, the best correlation with the visual stimulus. Okay. So just to run over these points real fast, retinal spikes that occur within 30 milliseconds of a previous spike are better at driving geniculate neurons. Those following short ISIs are more frequently evoked by the visual stimulus, carry more information. And this last part is what I think is interesting, is that the, whatever the biophysical properties that govern temporal summation and spike generation in the LGN appear to be tuned in that they have the same time course to capture those most informative spikes leaving the retina. Okay. So what about the feedback pathways? Now remember, we have monosynaptic excitation and disynaptic inhibition that's present. If you compare, this is just a retinal ganglion cell and LGN cell that are connected. This is 100 trials of presenting 300 milliseconds of a stimulus to them. And you can see that, you know, of course, the LGN cell is, is producing fewer spikes than the retinal cell did. But there's the opportunity to, to turn up that transfer or turn down that transfer of retinal spikes. And that's where I want to go with this. So we decided to use JAWS as a method to inactivate the corticogeniculate pathway. This is, so this is using a virus approach. So we use the AAV virus with a human synapsin promoter and that drives a halo rhodopsin, okay? And that's the JAWS. And what makes it JAWS is that, it's, is that it's sensitive to red wavelength light that gives us better penetration into deeper tissues. So on the left here, we're just looking at, oh, and it also has GFP <coughs> coupled to it. So we're looking at the expression of the JAWS down, or the GFP here, down to the deeper layers. We make these injections trying to focus on deeper layers. This is just blowing this up, and you can even label axons in the geniculate, which is cool because you can turn off those cortical inputs also by putting a fiber optic into the LGN if you want to. Okay, so this is just to show you that this is a very effective way of silencing the cortex. Two different cells shown here, laser goes on on the left. This is a drifting grating, that's why we see these periodic bursts of activity for that cortical cell when you turn on the red light the cortical activity goes down to next to nothing. Over here, another cell, this is a standing, uh, stationary stimulus. You turn on the light, the spontaneous activity goes down, you turn on the stimulus, and in the presence of red light, you get next to no response. So very effective means of turning off the cortex transiently and repeatedly. So what do you see in the geniculate? Okay, this slide is really important, this, but it's also pretty busy. What we're doing here is we're moving, we're recording from a geniculate cell, and then moving a fiber optic around in the cortex so that we can turn off different regions of cortex relative to where the receptive field of the geniculate cell is. So in these cases here, the geniculate cell's receptive field is at the center here, and then the position of the fiber optic relative to that in retinotopic space is indicated by these letters. The important part here in the top series of panels, these are all conditions where the fiber optic and the geniculate cell's receptive field were in close retinotopic register. Down below, this is when they were further apart spatially and retinotop uh, further apart retinotopically. When they are overlapping in each and every case, what you find is that when you turn on the light, the firing rate of the geniculate cell goes down. That means we're removing excitation or net excitation. Whereas when you're further away, the firing rate goes up when you silence the feedback pathways, okay? Indicating that you're removing net inhibition.
And when you put all of this together, what you end up with is a very nice center surround organization to feedback, where it looks like feedback that's retinotopically aligned is net excitatory, and that which is further away becomes net suppressive. And this last case over here is, is the furthest away where you see no influence of, of the feedback pathway. How big is that excitatory center compared to the receptive field size? Yeah, so in this case here, the receptive field sizes were about three degrees, and these all fall within that sort of three degree zone, okay? So the implications of this, which I just don't have time to go into, but it certainly has strong implications for extra classical suppression. That is, there's a zone surrounding cells' receptive fields where stimuli that fall into that will suppress a neuron's activity for gain control as well. Uh, covert attention, where you mentally attend to different regions of space, and also shifting cells in and out of burst and tonic activity modes. And maybe we can discuss some of that later. Okay, five minutes. Ah, I'm not as bad off as I thought. Okay, so I've alluded to the fact that the feedback from the cortex isn't going to be driving responses, but we can still look for that. And we can look for that by recording from an LGN cell while simultaneously monitoring its retinal input and asking what happens. And you can do that when you can, this is a great thing about the geniculate, is that you can record both action potentials and S potentials. S potentials are these small deflections that actually represent the, an extracellular measure of the, of the EPSP that's coming from the retina. So in this particular case here, you're recording from the geniculate cell. These are the S potentials up above. You turn on the laser, you see no influence on the S potentials, but the geniculate cells firing goes down. Okay, that's fine. But what we can do is ask, how did it affect that transfer of spikes? And that's what's shown to the right here. So this is retinal efficacy. It's a percentage of retinal spikes that would evoke, trigger a geniculate response. And you can see that efficacy drops by a little bit more than half when you turn off the, the feedback pathway. So we're, re, we're, we're interpretation being you're hyperpolarizing the cell, fewer of those retinal spikes get through. Okay. Now, last slide, data slide that I have for you here is comparing the influence of cortical input to the geniculate versus cortical input to the pulvinar nucleus. Okay, so we've already seen these two panels over here. This was a case where we see that uh, feedback, when you remove it, you suppress it, activity goes down. Here's the case where it goes up. The important thing is here, we're modulating the activity. We're not completely turning it off, turning off those geniculate cells. On the right, this is a case now where we silence the cortical pulvinar axons. And in this case, we're doing it, we don't want to turn off V1 for this. We want to turn off those axons as they're going into the pulvinar nucleus. So we're putting the fiber optic into the pulvinar. And here, so this is the situation here, the laser goes on, then we turn on the visual stimulus. In a control condition, there's this nice evoked response from the pulvinar cell. But when the, when the, when the uh, jaws is, is, is stimulated, you turn off the cell and that pulvinar response drops completely to zero, okay? That pulvinar cell cannot respond without the input that comes from V1. So definitely indicative of a driver input. Over here on the right, this is now, because these pulvinar cells are sort of unique and special, uh, that they can have very complex receptive fields relative to what a geniculate is. Geniculate receptive fields are nice center surround. The pulvinar has receptive fields that in many ways look like cortical receptive fields. And this was the cell's receptive field. It was a nice orientation selective cell. We've seen plenty of direction selective cells. And even cells whose receptive fields were struggling to even figure out what's the optimal stimulus for them, indicating likely convergence from, from multiple areas. But in all these cases, what's, what's neat about this is this is a method, I would call it uh, like opto-tagging. Okay, where you're using optogenetics to tell you that you've identified a cell that's getting input from a particular structure. And then you can ask what are the receptive field properties of that. So two things here. You can see that that V1 input is critical for that cell's activity. And also you can identify those cells to get a sense of what's, what are the response properties of cells in the pulvinar that get input from a cortical area, which is something that's eluded us for so long in the pulvinar because it's such a heterogeneous structure. Okay, so just to wrap up, what we've seen is that retinal ganglion cells produce many more spikes than their target neurons in the geniculate, that the LGN relays the most informative spikes to the cortex, that the communication can be enhanced or suppressed by feedback, that when the feedback's from retinotopically aligned regions, it provides net excitation. When it comes from regions further away, it's net suppression. And then lastly, that the projections modulate geniculate activity while projections to the pulvinar drive the pulvinar activity. And with that, this is just my group at Davis that contributed to the experiment, so thank you very much.
Yeah. So the uh, retina needs to squeeze a lot of information through the optic nerve, and we know that this principle allows us to explain a lot of properties. So it seems strange that you do all, make all that effort and then just throw away some of the spikes. Um, and uh, so I'm wondering, there ought to be at least some situations in which all the spikes do matter. Right, great question. You know, one thing that I would say for folks that study the retina, this notion that the brain wants to conserve ATP doesn't apply to the retina. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, they, there seems to be no hesitation to uh, produce a lot of spikes. And when you think about it, you know, it's a funny situation. If the stimulus is bright, half the cells are active. If it's dark, the other half are active. When you euthanize an animal and you're recording from like the geniculate, the retina, the cortex all together, you, the cortex disappears, the thalamus disappears, and the retina keeps going. It, it, does, it doesn't want to give up producing spikes for some odd reason. So I take your point that, uh, you know, that you would think that maybe it, every spike should get through in a certain situation, but nobody's ever found that, at least not in, in mammals that I'm aware of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, question about the circuit relative to your, uh, the impact of uh, the corticothalamic protection. So, what you show us is that if you silence uh, uh, neurons uh, in the cortex which are centered on the receptive field uh, of the DLGN neuron, then uh, you decrease the spiking of that neuron. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand you, si you silence the cortical neuron which are off uh, by a few degrees to the center of the receptive field uh, of the thalamic neuron, you facilitate the thalamic neuron. Now there are two possible circuits. One is a circuit in which uh, you actually use uh, the NRT to mm -hmm. And one is an intracortical circuit. Maybe silencing those cortical neurons which are off-center are going to facilitate mm. those other cortical neurons which are on-center through a local surround uh, uh, suppression uh, or right. uh, relief of surround <laughs> suppression, which will then increase the activity of those cortical neurons. Which would, uh, so which one? Would yeah, that's a that? really clever uh, idea, which I hadn't thought about. So I think maybe I'll have to think about this, but one approach might be for that would be to uh, move your fiber optic, rather than moving it around the cortex, move it around within the geniculate relative to the cell's receptive field. That might solve that, but I have to think about it a little. But it's a good point. Uh, uh, illustrating my ignorance of the anatomy, is there exactly one connection from a ganglion cell to every LGN cell? Or are there, I thought there were multiple converging ganglion cells on each LGN cell. Yeah, okay, good question. It depends on the species. So in the cat, there are, it's generally somewhere in the neighborhood of like two to four cells converging in terms of at least having effective connectivity, driving responses. And the monkey, it is one to one. So a uh, given geniculate cells believed to get input from just one retinal ganglion so cell. So in a cat, is it mm -hmm. possible that your more informative spikes are actually synchronous spikes? You sort of mentioned that from the LGN, the coincident spikes are driving V1 very nicely in this right. sort of super linear way. Is it possible the same story is true and you're just you're measuring information but what you're actually seeing is a result of synchrony? Or well that would be synchrony then within the retina. Right. Okay and that form of synchrony there are there have been some measures of that form of synchrony that tends to occur primarily through gap junction coupling in the retina which is something that you see with Y cells in the retina <coughs> not the X cells and and we find this in both the X and the Y pathways. Oh I so, guess I'm wondering oh. if it's 30 milliseconds Right, and you're saying the set of spikes that propagate through are the ones that are approximately, like you're getting these 30 millisecond yes. sort of times. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine the probability of getting another spike from right. another converting retinal ganglion cell was higher right. at the times where there's a stimulus yeah. driving that. I guess so I know where you're coming from. So I think how I would explain that from the plots that I showed you was that when I, when I showed you this plots where the x-axis was the inner spike interval, those first spikes of the pair never had an efficacy of zero. They were elevated up some, and that's probably likely that they're coming on the heels of a spike from another retinal ganglion cell. If you did that same plot in the monkey, those, those first spikes would, would have an efficacy of zero. Yeah, good question. Huh? Ken? So that, uh, it, it, it's a bit of a paradox what you showed about pulmonar and V1, that pulmonar activity depends on V1 activity, but also V1 activity depends on pulmonar activity. So in some sense, they're, they're bootstrapping themselves up where neither right. one alone can, can, uh, can sustain activity? You know, that's an interesting, we were just discussing that at lunch, okay? The study that indicated that the pulvinar is essential for, for V1 activity. And at our lunch table, we came to the conclusion that the, the, that, that was a, um, 
an ambitious statement. Uh, <laughs> and, and that rather, if you look at the data more closely, it really looks like the pulvinar is modulating V1 activity. OK, because Vivian Casagrande also, yeah. also has Yeah, a, that's what I'm referring to. It's really, it's really affecting the gain of, uh, and lowering the gain of transmission of V1. But it's not setting the gain to zero. That's, that, was, that was our conclusion, yes. Whereas in the other direction, yes. uh, V1 to pulvinar, that, that really, without V1, pulvinar really goes to zero. That's right. That's right. And what I can say for those, I didn't have any data for this, but we have been doing the recordings in V1 when we turn off the, the axons entering the pulvinar from V1. And we don't see, in our hands, we don't see a change in the firing rate of V1 cells. What we find is that the spike field coherence drops dramatically indicating that whatever's driving that field, let's call it you know, correlated ensemble activity, network activity, that, there's, that the pulvinar is, is decreasing that, that, um, that sort of maybe uh, community synchrony that you would see when the pulvinar is removed. That's a big stretch to take, but certainly the, we don't see the, the cortex going silent. Okay, but, but the, the, the example you showed, the, the V1 cell went silent when you silenced pulvinar, right? No, that was silencing V1. The example I showed was a fiber optic in V1. Oh, but I think you showed in both directions. Maybe, okay, I must be this Yeah, I think you might be thinking. I showed a lot. <laughs> but, but when you saw the cortex V1 go silent, that was with the fiber optic in V1. And when you saw the pulvinar go silent, that was with the fiber optic in the pulvinar. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, um, I think we should thank think so. Marty All right. one more time. All right, thank you. Our next speaker is Farron Briggs.